Today, the name Jane Goodall is almost synonymous with animal research. Accomplished author, speaker, and now a PhD, she is sought all over the world. A rarity among scientists, she has become a celebrity in her own right. He wasn't having it at all. He wanted to follow his adolescent brother. Wherever she goes on her annual lecture tours, eager crowds gather to hear the latest chapter in the lives of the chimps. Any new, particularly new developments, new behavior of chimps? Two quite interesting new developments. One is concerned with territoriality. Though she welcomes the opportunity to share her world, Jane keeps her visit short. Gombe is where she most wants to be. With her on this trip are her mother, returning for a nostalgic visit, and Grub, now 15. Though not even Jane could have predicted her study would last this long, it is 22 years since she first set foot on Gombe shores. In that time, the country has gone from British rule to independence. Gombe, once a game reserve, is now a national park. But friendships that span more than two decades remain unchanged. <laughs> Today, permanent structures have replaced Jane's lakeshore tent, and a staff of 10 Tanzanian field assistants has been trained to help observe the chimps. The men work in teams of two and follow the animals seven days a week. In recent years, they, along with Jane, witnessed a startling turn of events. Like Gombe itself, the chimps, it seemed, had changed too. If I'd left, as Louis Leakey predicted, after 10 years, we would have had a very different picture of the chimpanzees to that which we have today. People's idea of the gentle, noble, savage would have been exemplified by the way of life of the chimps. I started off studying one community, and in 1972 that community divided into two. And one part of it moved down into the south of the range that the whole community had shared. Two years later, a series of events began which were amongst the most horrifying that we've seen at Gombe. The males of the larger Kasakela community, the ones that we're studying today, systematically began to hunt down individuals of the smaller southern community to attack them when they found them on their own or in small groups. And within a four-year period, every one of the seven males and at least one of the three females who had moved to the south had disappeared. The sequence of events that occurred during this warfare were really shocking because these attacks were not over in one minute. They lasted 20 minutes. They were gang attacks where between three and six adult males together attacked one victim. The victim was rendered senseless, virtually crouching on the ground, not even trying to fight back. And yet they would pound him, they would drag him, they would bite him, they would smash him. One of them had a broken leg, one of them had a great piece of skin ripped from his thigh. And these were very, very brutal attacks. And I think it's a bit horrifying to consider that just because we now know how aggressive the chimpanzee can be, this makes him even more like humans than I thought they were before. Only because Jane stayed on at Gombe was the warfare discovered. Only because she remains there still may it one day be explained. While the male gang violence was a profoundly dramatic event, much of Jane's work continues to revolve around the subtle intricacies of day-to-day -day family life. Her observations of Flo and Flint taught her just how powerful a mother's influence can be. In the 10 years since Flo died, 
Jane has followed her family into its third generation. Flo's daughter, Fifi, is now a mother herself. Like Flo, Fifi is an extremely playful and tolerant mother. Her son, Frodo, bears a striking resemblance to his dead uncle, Flint. Young Fanny evokes images of Fifi herself as a child. And in adolescent Freud, a visible reminder of Figgin as he matured. Gwenna now watches Frodo, getting much more active than he used to be. As she watches Getty, the youngest member of the Gombe community, secure in his mother's arms, Jane reflects on ten other infants who, over the course of four years, met a gruesome fate. There was one extremely horrifying day. I was in Dar es Salaam, and we were contacting Gombe by radio, as we used to do every morning. And this strange message came over that the adult female passion and her adolescent daughter, Pom, had seized a newborn infant from Gilka. Gilka, one of the polio victims, a chimp I'd known since she was one year old. And that this mother, Passion, had killed the baby, and she and her daughter and her son had shared the body between them. And I found this almost impossible to believe, but when I got to Gombe a week later, it was indeed true. And over the next four years, Passion and her daughter, Pom, were known to kill and eat three newborn babies. They were watched as they tried but failed to catch two more. And we suspect that in that four years, in fact, they were responsible for the deaths of 10 newborn babies. Jane had always described Passion as a somewhat unnatural mother cold and indifferent, indeed often callous to her youngsters. Yet Jane could not possibly have predicted that Passion would become a killer, attacking with aggression so violent that she paid no attention to human observers even when they tried to intervene. Why did they do it? I really have no idea. I suspect that it was an aberrant behavior shown first by the mother, imitated by the daughter. It was perhaps the hardest thing to understand and to accept that's ever happened at Gombe. And the descriptions of the attacks on these mothers are some of the most moving and horrifying descriptions that have taken place in all the 22 years. For instance, when Passion, together with Pom, two strong females, attacked Melissa with her three-week-old baby, Melissa's daughter, Gremlin, much younger than Pom, ran over to the two field assistants who were watching this horrifying struggle, stood upright, looked into their eyes, looked back at the scene, and really seemed to be begging for help. But Passion and Pom were strong, stronger than Melissa, and they managed to seize the baby, leaving Melissa terribly badly wounded. The moment they had the baby and had killed it, when Melissa went up, to watch as they ate it, Passion reached out, embraced and kissed her as though, I have no quarrel with you, I wanted your baby, now I'm content. And as I say, we just do not understand this behavior. Hopefully now the behavior is finished. Passion is dead, Pom has shown no signs of doing this, and indeed on her own isn't capable of attacking another female and stealing her baby. For now, the warfare is over. The cannibalism has ceased. Gombe is quiet again, but for the eternal sounds of the African night. Then, on a summer evening in 1982, a joyous chorus of human voices pervades the dark. An anniversary party celebrating 22 years of research at Gombe. To share this night, some have come by boat, others have walked for miles. With traditional feasting and speeches, they join together to toast the future and celebrate the past. Well, after 22 years, I have many, many fond memories of Gombe. Perhaps the one that I like to think back on most was after having 
struggled, crawled through the undergrowth, climbed up to the peak and down again and searched and been rewarded, yes, by seeing chimps, but chimps that ran away every time I went up to them. To have a chimpanzee just sit there and watch me and know that I was there and not mind, that was a very, very wonderful moment. It was a tremendous feeling of accomplishment and exhilaration and pride in the fact that I'd been accepted. And then a rather different kind of memory was the first time that a wild chimpanzee mother came up to me and allowed her infant to reach out with that wondering expression in his eyes to touch me. And that, of course, was Flo with her infant, Flint. And that's another moment I'll never forget. And though it often seems a lifetime ago, she remembers them all. Three generations of chimps who allowed her the privilege of entering their private world. Wild animals roaming free, who permitted a human to live among them as a friend. Today, the direction of the study lies uncharted ahead, to be written by the chimps themselves. It is a future Jane Goodall embraces with anticipation and a personal dream. I hope to stay at Gombe for as long as I can struggle around the mountains. And even after that, I would hope that I can train somebody to follow in my footsteps so that when I'm old and doddering lady, I can still hear about Melissa's grandchildren and Fifi's successes and be happy in my old age. When Lewis Leakey told Jane her study might last 10 years, it sounded like a lifetime, and privately she thought three years at most. Already into her third decade at Gumby, the pioneer who dared to be accepted by wild animals and won has no intention of leaving now.